All right. Thank you, everyone. Welcome back. And welcome to this afternoon's Deep Dive Workshop titled, Have You Ever Wished You Had a Crystal Ball for Customer Behavior? Rory uh, is a tough act to follow. I'm not going to lie, I'm not as funny. I'm about as inappropriate. Um, but I'm going to try and keep it clean for, for the 40 minutes that we have together. Um, he did, however, set this up really well when he was talking about the snapshot and the longitudinal, when he was talking about averages, when he was talking about anomalies. What we're going to do over the next 40 minutes is we're going to take a closer look at one of our customers' data sets. So we're going to look at live data from one of our customers using our new product, Cognitive Pulse, which is an insights and activation platform that's going to be coming out on April the 4th. And in the deep dive, we're going to be looking at a snapshot of current customer behavior. We're going to look backwards in time to see how customer behavior has evolved. We'll predict what customer behavior is going to be in the future. And along the way, we're going to try and identify tactical recommendations, actionable insights, and strategic opportunities to help this brand improve their business. Fair warning right now, this is not a pretty story. This business is kind of a train wreck. I know all about train wrecks because I live in Ohio. For those that are from America, that might be funny. Um, and without further ado, I guess let me introduce myself uh, a little bit more. By the way, personal introduction, my name is Anthony Winthizer. I'm the Chief Product Officer at Cognitive. The last few years of my career have been focused on loyalty and CX, topics that we've been discussing over the last few days. But the majority of my career has really been spent in data, analytics, ad tech, martech, and more recently, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so what we're going to go through over the next 40 minutes is going to feel a little bit different than I think a lot of the content that we reviewed over the last few days, and that it's going to be less about loyalty and CX, and it's going to be more about the data and analytic component that informs excellent loyalty and, and CX. And kind of like love and marriage going together like horse and carriage, data and analytics does the same with, with loyalty and CX. A little bit about Cognitive, for those who aren't too familiar with Cognitive. Our purpose at Cognitive is to help brands build deeper, more meaningful relationships. And the way that we do that is by providing software and services to help design, build, and manage loyalty. When we talk about relationships, we're equally focused on relationships with prospects, customers, as well as former customers that we're hoping to re-engage. So it's a focus on the entire life cycle, not just active customers, which unfortunately is a, is a limiting point for a lot of loyalty programs. But relationships also extend to partners. We've had some great sessions over the last day or two, some great conversations around the value of partnerships and the value that partnerships can bring to loyalty programs. And so we take a very broad approach when we're thinking about relationships and the value that they can bring to customers in loyalty programs and also outside of loyalty programs. And when we talk about loyalty, we refer to loyalty as the outcome, not necessarily loyalty as the program. When we talk about loyalty, we're focused on loyalty for all customers, not just loyalty for those that are in the program, but also those that are outside of the program that are still engaged with the brand and may not be a part of the loyalty program for one reason or, or another. Now that introductions are out of the way, Let's start to get into the deeper end of the workshop. I know that the demo is probably going to be the more interesting part of, of the session here. By way of hands, by show of hands, has anyone struggled in accessing or connecting customer data to get better or deeper insights on their customer? About half of the audience, maybe 60% of the audience raised their hand. You're not alone. 60% of business leaders describe data silos as a top barrier to better capturing, analyzing, and acting on data. The end result of that, one of the end results of that, is no real-time view of customer behavior. That's a problem, and you're going to see why when we get into this case study. By show of hands, has anyone struggled in delivering personalized customer experiences at scale? All right. A lot of people raise their hands, similar proportion to the last question. You're not alone. 63% of digital marketing leaders struggle with personalization, yet only 17% use AI and machine learning across the function. One of the outcomes of that is a lack of predictive and prescriptive insights on how to best engage a customer to build a relationship and drive mutual value for both the customer and the brand. 
Last question then. Where there is customer insight, has anyone struggled in activating on that insight? Again, good show of hands. You're not alone. 85% of respondents say their company lacks both a 360-degree view of the customer data and the structure to make use of those insights. One of the outcomes of that being no connection to activation channels. These are persistent pain points in need of a solution. But it's not too surprising that this is kind of where the industry is today. If we think of the first one, thinking about customer platforms, CRM as an example, CDP as an example, they're not great sources of data. They're great sources for some data, but they're not great sources for all of the data that you need to properly engage your customers in a long-term relationship. When we look at the middle one, thinking of activation platforms, Activation platforms are great at activating, but they're not terribly smart. So customer platforms aren't great stores of data. Activation, activation platforms aren't terribly intelligent. And then analytic platforms, which is where you might put all of your data once you get it, aren't terribly well connected. And so you've got this problem where you have no real-time view of customer behavior. We lack the insights to, to activate. And even when we have them, we have no connection to activation channels. And so we're kind of in this world where we've got this 80-20 rule where 80% of businesses, I think it's more than that, 90% of businesses feel like they deliver personalized experiences to their customers, but only 20 to 30% of customers feel that a brand recognizes them and engages them in a meaningful and relevant way. That statistic hasn't changed in 10 years. Personalization isn't new, loyalty programs aren't new. That statistic is so steady that if you pull it for every year, you can go online and find these statistics, it's almost the same ratio every single year. And that's because the solutions that we're using today are limited. That's why we developed Cognitive Pulse. Cognitive Pulse is an insights and activation tool to help marketers track and act on customer value, customer migration, and customer opportunity. We do it by combining descriptive and predictive analytics to provide actionable recommendations and strategic insight to help marketers better engage their customers. When we get into the demo, we're going to cover five screens. We're going to start on the left with Health Check, where we're going to monitor the health of your customer database. This is the snapshot that Rory was referring to earlier. There's value in it, but it's of limited value. What you need is a longitudinal understanding of the customer's engagement with the brand, their relationship with the brand, and that's where we're going to get into the Describe screen, where we talk about tracking changes in customer behavior over time. There's more insight there. The next best thing after that is to then take that behavior, take that understanding of the customer's relationship and its evolution over time, and predict what that customer's behavior is going to be in the future. Are they going to stabilize in their engagement with the brand? Are they going to increase their engagement with the brand? Or are they going to continue on their decline? That's going to be the predict screen that we walk through in the case study here in a, in a minute or two. Then we have prescribe, which is, a, which is a screen where we'll be able to act on the insights with prescriptive recommendations. It's one thing to be able to say, hey, this customer is in a declining segment, or they're in a stable segment, or we've just acquired them. It's another thing to be able to identify every single day which specific customers you need to engage in each particular segment. And that's what Prescribe does. And then lastly, from a more, let's call it organized strategic insight perspective, we have Diagnose, which answers fundamental questions in terms of acquisition, retention, and maximization, the quality and the quantity of relationships. How is the business doing in a very simple red, yellow, green with trended metrics? So we'll wrap up there. Before we get into the actual demo, though, we've got two slides just to set the foundation in terms of how we're how we're calculating the data that we're going to be looking at. Uh, G, yesterday in her session with Phil, talked a little bit about the Smart Journey Lifecycle Stage methodology. This is a methodology that we've had in place now for, for a number of years, the majority of Cognitive is 35 years in business. And it's, it's been put in place for over 50 global clients across the globe. It works across multiple verticals, retail, restaurant, hospitality, financial services. And what we do is we break out customer behavior across these eight different segments, starting with Acquire, which is a customer 
showing some intent. Maybe it's a registration to an email program, maybe it's signing up for the loyalty program, maybe it's browsing the website. We can define triggers in different ways. From the point that they've made a purchase, they move into activate. And as Rory said earlier, one purchase does not establish a relationship. One purchase establishes trial, it doesn't establish trust. So we've been very clear about differentiating customers in the activate segment versus customers in engage and grow, which have made multiple purchases across multiple business cycles. When they do that, then they're moving from a trial basis relationship to one that's more based on trust with more established behavior. They'll go into engage. Engage is a stable customer relationship. Grow is a customer relationship where the customer is spending more. They're either buying more products, making more trips. There's some kind of element of expansion there. And then on the downside, when we're looking at corrective segments, we have customers that are in the declining stage where they're still active, but they're spending less. They're spending less per trip. They're making fewer trips. And those are still active customers. So we have activate, engage, grow, and decline. Those are the four active customers in the segmentation. And then further down, we have customers at risk. So they've lapsed in their purchasing in the most recent business cycle, but there's still a chance to rescue them. Churn, uh, sorry, dormant are customers who have lapsed for multiple business cycles, lower probability of reactivating them. And then churn are essentially lost customers with zero probability of, of reactivation. Conceptually, this is pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward, right? Anyone who's seen a lifecycle stage segmentation before will probably be like, yeah, this, this makes a lot of sense. There's nuance in terms of the definition. What is new is the fact that we have taken a methodology that typically takes multiple weeks and a team of data scientists working on this methodology for multiple weeks into an automated AI and ML process that will run by itself in a matter of hours. And this allows us to run this methodology every single day for any client that is using this product. The segmentation is powered by cognition. For those who aren't familiar with cognition, cognition is the artificial intelligence and machine learning layer that sits on the cognitive platform and generates the intelligence feed that delivers data into every single one of the products on the platform. There are three key pieces that I want to call out uh, from a methodological perspective. We don't have enough time to really get into cognition in, in its full extent because we want, to get into the, we want to get into the demo. But the first is customer level modeling. Rory talked a little bit about anomalies versus averages. Averages are where insights go to die, essentially. We get a perception of the customer, perception of the customer behavior that is fundamentally incorrect. And when you think of the world that we live in where a lot of what we do is based on a segment or it's based on a cohort, which essentially is an average of customers that have been defined a specific way, we lose a lot of the insight that allows us to engage a customer in a meaningful way. And so one of the things that's really critical to what we've done here is we model at the individual customer level. Every single customer is analyzed on an individual basis. And I think the best way to kind of bring this to life is I had a co-founder at my last shop who would get up in meetings and talk about the value of customer level modeling versus, versus segments and cohorts. And he would say, if you're in the kitchen and you open the freezer drawer and you stick your hand in the freezer and then you turn on the oven and you stick your hand on the oven, your body temperature is going to be 99.6. It's going to be perfectly in balance. Don't confuse that with the fact that you're going to lose both hands eventually. That's why it's so critical to move to customer level modeling in everything, everything that we do from an analytic and an activation perspective. That is only enabled by multi-factor machine learning core, which essentially is a combination of different algorithms that are working in different ways, but working together to generate stable output that you can make decisions on. And then the output is a combination, as I mentioned earlier, of descriptive and predictive factors, which we'll, which we'll bring to life here in, in the demo. So let me switch over screens here, and I think we'll be able to get into Cognitive Pulse. All right, so I mentioned that we're going to go through five, we're going to go through five screens here. This is live client data for one of our clients. They're in the gas and oil sector, so gas convenience operator. Uh, they're a global client. They operate in multiple countries. So this is live data in one of their markets. 
I'm just going to walk through all of this. Uh, if anyone has you know, questions or thoughts uh, along the way, let's, let's make this interactive. We started at the top with a series of KPIs, active customers, inactive customers, number of transactions, total revenue, uh, and, then, and then the established business cycle. Below that, we have spend per transaction, transactions per customer, spend per customer, CLV, and then health score, which is a proprietary metric. This is all pretty basic. Anyone running a business, any marketer running a business, any finance person running a business would like to know these metrics off the top of their head. But how many times have you been in a business meeting where you ask, what's, what's the CLV of this customer? What's their average transaction frequency? How much do they spend on, on the average trip? Most people will have a number that's out of date. It might be a week out of date, but most likely it's a month out of date, maybe it's a quarter out of date. And in that gap, between when that data was last generated, ad hoc, manually, by some analytics team, versus where the customer is today, you can have a huge discrepancy in behavior that can spell the difference between either business success or, or business failure. So we start off with the basics. This is all very basic. Everything in the health check is basic, but it updates daily. So the business always knows what is going on with their business. It gives them the pulse on their business. We report total revenue below that, breaking it out into each of the individual segments in the Smart Journey methodology. So we can see that roughly half of the revenue is with the engaged customer segment. These are stable customers. We then have less in grow and even less in decline. If we compare grow as a positive, those in a positive relationship versus those in a declining relationship, we can see that that's a net positive. And so this gives the impression that the business overall is stable, but moving in the right direction. This is this is a fairly good story. It all goes downhill from here, so we'll, we'll get into the good stuff. Total revenue by segment, interesting. Now let's start to look at customers. We're going to drill in a little bit deeper, because now we're reporting customers by segment, breaking out customers in the loyalty program versus customers not in the loyalty program. How many today? compare the behavior of their loyalty customers side by side with the, with the behavior of their non-loyalty customers. You're ahead of the curve. That's good. Most brands that we work with do not have the ability to do side-by-side -side comparison because loyalty data sits in an entirely different system than the non-loyalty data. So we can see here you know, the distribution among, among active segments. Let's call it about a 50-50 split, which is pretty good for a, for a well-penetrated loyalty program. What we start to see here for the first time, we have zero revenue for customers at risk and customers that are in dormant. But we start to see customer counts for, for those in these segments. And you can see there's a big discrepancy in terms of those that have lapsed and whether they're in the program or not in the program. So this starts to tell an interesting story about the value of being in the loyalty program. So that's interesting. Let's, let's break it down a little bit more. Let's start to get into revenue. So now we're looking at the revenue distribution across each of these segments. And not surprisingly, customers generally in, in the loyalty segment spend more than, than customers not in the loyalty segment, just at an aggregate level, assuming a 50-50 split. The first thing you see here from an, from an insight perspective, though, is looking at the customers that we've lost but can still be reactivated. We have a $6 million opportunity. This is fresh data calculated as of this morning. If the brand can identify the customers that are at risk and dormant that can still be salvaged, that's a huge opportunity for the business to engage them at the right time. And that's what this product does. It identifies who to engage and when to engage them. And then the other piece of insight that you can get in the health check is looking at revenue per customer, so revenue divided by customer. And what you see here is that almost consistently across all of the active segments, the value of a customer in the loyalty program is about $30 higher than customers that aren't in the loyalty program. Who has the ability to measure the difference in value between a customer in the loyalty program and not in the loyalty program on a daily basis? Then you're ahead of the curve. So revenue, revenue per customer. Again, a lot of the basic reporting that a lot of bands struggle to get. We can do the same thing with lifetime value. And so if we have a $30 difference in, in uh, value uh, above from a, from a revenue within the measurement period over the lifetime, that, that increases. So that $30 is actually a monthly, a monthly value. 
when we look over the lifetime of a customer, which in this case is, is just under two years, we're looking at a delta between a customer in the loyalty program versus not in the loyalty program, but anywhere between $800 and $1,000. For a marketer trying to justify the existence of their loyalty program, or for a CFO trying to justify investment in loyalty initiatives or customer experience initiatives, this type of data is going to help, is going to help build that story. So that's, that's the health check screen. Interesting, it's a snapshot. What's, what's more interesting, perhaps, is looking at the evolution of customers. How did they get from where they were to where they are? And so we've built out customer flows where we have every single customer in, uh, distributed across the eight segments, acquire, activate, engage, so on and so forth. And we look at their flows from a previous period to a current period. So we're looking at January versus February. And you know, it kind of looks like a big bowl of spaghetti, right? Customer behavior is not linear. Again, another point that Rory brought home. Customer behavior is chaotic. A customer will decline one period. They'll increase another period. And so it's really difficult to make, to make sense of customer behavior sometimes. But what we can do by having these customer flows and being able to drill into these customer flows is we can say, let's just pick some, you know, some random segments here. We're going to try and do this live and hope nothing breaks. We're going to click on Acquire. Let's look at customers that we've acquired and look at how their behavior has changed when, when we look at their behavior across time and what that might mean for the business. So here we're looking at customers that we've acquired. They've shown some kind of intent, some kind of interest in the brand, but they haven't yet transacted. What this is showing that is that we had 9,564 customers that we acquired in the previous period, and almost all of them stayed in the acquire phase. We didn't convert them. We didn't onboard them. That's a lost opportunity, and that's a strategic insight for the marketing team to think about how can we convert interest into purchase. If we look at another segment, so we saw that acquisition is weak. Now let's look at the next segment, activation. So these are customers that have purchased once, and we want to see what's our ability to convert them into a repeat buyer and get them to purchase twice. This story isn't much better. We had 10,000 customers in the activate segment. 40% of them stayed in the activate phase. So they purchased once, they didn't purchase again. Some of them moved to grow, so they did make another purchase. They moved forward. It's exa exactly what we want to see. But then we had almost 50% of them go to at risk. They did not purchase when they were expected to purchase based on all the information and analytics that we've done. So again, from an Activate perspective, also a bleak picture as with Acquire. And then lastly, if we look at at risk, I'll bring at risk up here real quick. At risk customers are customers who have lapsed in their purchase, but they're still within one purchase cycle of, of their last purchase. What you would expect to see in a well-run CRM program, a well-run loyalty program, is that we're able to reactivate those customers that are at risk because there's still a relationship there that can be salvaged. But unfortunately, what we've seen for, for this customer is that almost the entirety of customer as at risk either stay at risk or go dormant, which is the next step down in, in the relationship that they have with the brand. So this business is struggling with acquisition, activation, onboarding, and then on the back end, they're also struggling with reactivation. I said it wasn't a pretty picture, and, and that pretty much paints it. The third screen is predict. So we've looked backwards in time, now let's look forward in time. The, the mess of spaghetti has gotten even worse. We can see the customers fl flow. They, some flow in, some flow out. That just speaks to the chaotic nature of customer behavior. You will see this, we will see this, and every single client that we do this for, whether it's fast moving or whether it's slow moving. But a few call outs here is that if we look at engage, which are stable customer relationships, what we can see is that you've got a 3% decline from a previous period to the current period. And the logical question is, will that stabilize? Will it increase? Will it get worse? The prediction is that it's actually going to get worse the deceleration is going to increase to a 5.5% decline. Not surprisingly, if you look at the flip side of it with declining customers, that segment is increasing 14% from January all the way through to March. This updates every single day. If you are in a marketing team, if you're in a CRM or a loyalty team, and you're driving activation every single day, and you can track activation every single day, you can monitor 
conversion, positive or negative, from one segment to the next to understand where are we making traction in the business, where are the areas of weakness in the business, and what can we do from a planning and execution perspective to improve the overall performance of the business. There's a ton of strategy and insight, implication and application here. But this doesn't quite get, this doesn't quite get to activation when we think about it on an individual customer level, and that's why we built Prescribe. Prescribe takes the concept of one-to-one -one customer level activation and it brings it to life in this product by looking at every single one of the segments. We've got the same eight segments from acquire all the way to churn and looking at the customers in each segment, the, the solution identifies which customers need to be engaged today. So it's one thing to know that we've got 14,929 customers that are at risk. It's another thing to know that 1,642 of them need to be engaged today. Tomorrow that number may be higher, tomorrow that number may be lower. You may have some customers that are still there and some customers that have fallen, fallen in and out. But the ability to know every single day which customers need to be activated, and clearly with different messages because there are different stages in their relationship with the brand, is incredibly powerful for, for a brand. A user can export all of the data for all of the segments if they want. They can, they can automatically connect it to either another cognitive product or they can connect it to Salesforce or, or an Adobe. If it's a CRM, they connect it to a Snowflake or an AWS if they want to send it to the cloud first for additional, for additional analytics. But we've got the connectivity there so that with the insight, we can also drive the activation. For a user that's relatively new in, in their usage of this data, if they want to export one segment or, or select segments for additional manual effort, they also have that option, that option there. And so then to wrap up, We've covered the end-to-end -end cycle of insights all the way through to activation. But there's one additional piece that we wanted to build out, which we haven't diagnosed. And this is meant to be a quick kind of report card on the, the strategy and areas of weakness or opportunity that, that a brand might have. And so we've broken it out into questions that we expect marketers will typically ask from an acquisition perspective as well as questions that we expect that they'll typically ask from a relationship perspective. And we'll break it out into quantity of, of the relationship versus quality. And so you have questions such as, are we acquiring more new customers than we're losing to dormancy? It'd be really nice to have a real-time feed on, on whether that's trending positively or negatively. Here, it's, it's flat, right? Orange is flat. Are we spending more on loyalty points for new customers than we have in the past? That's red. That's showing that while we're stable in acquiring new customers, we're spending more. Our acquisition cost is increasing. That speaks to reduced effectiveness. That speaks to reduced efficiency. When we look at how do recently acquired customers spend in their early life compared to previously acquired customers, what we do see is that it actually is positive. So that is trending in the right direction. Every single one of these has, has a breakout chart and description. Um, and then we see, however, while we are acquiring customers, they're spending less. They're not as valuable. And so you have this kind of back and forth that you can quickly see every single day in terms of where the strengths are, where the weaknesses are, and what the opportunities are. And that's, that's essentially what we have with, with Pulse. Pulse is the heartbeat of your customers, or it's where marketers can understand the heartbeat of their customers. And wrapping up here, um, it's part of Cognitive's platform that's focused on all-in-one, omni-audience, omni-channel loyalty, execution. So Cognitive Pulse there on the left is part of our advanced loyalty pillar along with Cognitive and Inspire, which is our loyalty management system. And the data from Pulse can feed into Inspire as well as it can feed into Ignite and Amplify, which is our customer level always on engagement tools. And then also our partner collaboration with Cognitive Marketplaces where we leverage the power of partnerships um, so that we can deliver more offers, values, uh, and rewards to customers in our loyalty programs. If anyone has any questions, we can, we can talk to them now. If anyone wants to learn more about the product, Brendan is here, I think, through cocktail hour and night at the museum. Thank you. <laughs> Question right here. Thanks a lot for the presentation. A really cool tool that you have there. Um, I really like the chart that you're showing, like the comparison between non-loyalty and loyalty members. I think that's extremely insightful. However, we always have uh, in the organization like this question about the guys who are loyal are actually my best clients before we have loyalty. So 
are they naturally going to be more profitable and yeah. have more sales? So what you're showing is like it's proving that those guys are better, that the ones are not loyal, but it's not proving that I'm making more money than they were doing before, right? So yeah. all you're assessing that piece. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and it's a, it's a question that I asked when I first you know, started working in loyalty in CX. Are they valuable because they're joining the program, or are they joining the program because they're valuable? That's, that's basically the question. And in all, all honesty, as an analytics person, I'll tell you that that's just reporting the raw data. It's a starting point in terms of getting to a true bottom line attribution to get to that incrementality that, that results in, uh, in the total value generated by the program. That being said, am I still on? Yeah. That being said, the data that we're bringing in, so we're bringing in customer level data, we're matching across a number of demographic variables, we're getting as close to a lookalike model as possible when we're comparing behavior, and if we're truly going to get to quantifying the difference in terms of value versus non, uh, value of loyalty versus non-loyalty, if you're controlling for all of those other parameters, duration of relationship, geodemographic variables, income, all of those things, purchasing frequency categories, all that stuff, and you can track that longitudinally, Again, going back to Rory's point about snapshots versus, versus longitude, you can answer, you can answer that question. And that is, that is baked into to the, underlying, the underlying calculations that do go into some of that. Yeah. Great. Uh, any, any more? We got questions? one in the back. One there? OK. Uh, thank you for the great presentation, but uh, one question you didn't answer is, you said, um, how can you really combine all these silos, and you said um, it's an easy way to access all that data, because um, this is like the end product, you showed that you have already all the data, but what's the beauty, how you get easily connected all that data? Yeah, th there's, no, there's no easy answer, there's no magic solve. Someone has to do the work at the end of the day, so if you as the customer have disparate data sets living in, living in different places. Either you have to do that in terms of bringing it together, or we do it. And part of, part of the scope of the product, part of the scope of the initial implementation is specifying the data requirements that we need, establishing the, the APIs or SFTP file drops, and mapping all of that and setting up those channels so that the data starts to flow. Someone does the work. We've decided to take the work on as part of part of the scope of the deliverable. That way it reduces the burden on IT, it reduces the burden on marketing, and given that the product pretty much stands up in 24 to 48 hours, it's a pretty easy solve if you have the right backend set up. Okay, anyone else? Yeah. All right, all right, thank you. Thank you.